Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Eve Mayer. How are you doing, Eve? I'm fantastic, John. How are you? Great. And Eve is in Texas today and I'm here as usual in San Diego. So what we wanted to talk about was core values in a digital world. So let's get straight into it, uh, Eve. Um, why, why is there even a need to discuss core values? I mean, what has the digital world done that we need to sort of revisit what values we should have when operating in this digital world? Well, I, I think um, I'm not sure if it's the digital part that has made us need to explore core values. Mm -hmm. um, think back to most of the jobs you've had, and, and maybe you're an exception, but I think if you ask most people, they'll tell you that they don't know what the core values of their company are, mm -hmm. or if they do know them, that they're absolute crap they don't believe in, um, or they can barely recite one of them and don't know how they apply to them. So I think that core values should be revisited um, because they are usually horrible. <laughs> and I think the fact that we're in this digital world means that even if they're great, which gosh, I hope that they are, or we get to that point, uh, a lot of us are working virtually. A lot of us, John and I, this is our second time. We yeah. feel like we know each other, but we've never <laughs> met in person. Um, how do we translate that to an international staff? How do we have core values that really stay in front of a virtual staff or an international staff or a staff that comes in a couple of days a week or never comes in? How do we translate that? So I think those are some of the questions we're asking. Yeah, because I think I think it's uh, there's, it's interesting on two levels. Number one, if we take, as you say, if we take the digital part out for a second, um, every company for years has said, "Oh, you know, love to put up on their website or on the wall or bumper sticker, here's our here's our core values." But you know, nobody really paid any attention to them. They're just something that was put together. And as you say, now in the digital world. Uh, with people working virtually, et cetera, how do you, if you really do believe in your core values, how do you get people who are so remote to coalesce and really represent those, uh, those values? Right. So, you know, the past couple of years, I've been talking a lot about millennials, which I'm, you know, well, I know you probably thought I was a millennial. I really, shockingly, I did. You're not. Yeah. Shockingly, I'm 44 years old. So I'm not, but um, thank you. Both. <laughs> um, so anyway, you know, more and more millennials are really hoping for a place that they work that has values, that has a standard of more than we're just here to make money. And, and hopefully more than just millennials want that. I want that. I think most people want that. I think there was a time that you signed on for a job for 30 years and you got a gold watch at the end of it and you just cared that you had a job and you didn't really care about the higher purpose. You just wanted to work. Mm -hmm. And I think now um, as entrepreneurs, if you start a company, man, I hope you're not just doing it just because of the money because there's a lot easier, less heartbreaking, less stressful ways to make money than, than being an entrepreneur and starting another company. Hopefully you're doing it because you want to make money. And because you want to create some kind of culture, you want to have some kind of value system that you build with a group of people that you believe in. And I think millennials are pushing for that and they want to understand what it is. They want to be part of something. And at the same time, the way that many of us only meet or converse digitally, at the same time, we have more workplaces that are virtual or part virtual. We have to be able to be part of something and be part of these core values um, through digital because uh, sometimes we don't get to see each other or sometimes we don't get to be together in person as much. And it's a challenge for most companies to build that culture. And I think core values should really be a way that you put a stake in the ground of what your culture is and clearly define it so you can set behaviors that come from that. Right. Because let's face it, say, for instance, if you set down like a core value your company is, you know, respect for your customers or something or you know you're very customer focused you really respect your customers um then there are so many different touch points today with the customers how do you know that all of those communications are being executed with the kind of respect uh, and, and you know that you're looking for so so before 
um, let's face it, years ago in an organization, there was only a couple of touch points, right? You know, the salesperson had a touch point, and then out to the broader world, it was your marketing or PR people who handled it. But now if there's so many customer service and just with social media, there's so many touch points. So how do you how do you ensure that if you adopt a certain value that you can really make sure that it is adopted across the whole virtual organization? Well, I think that if you're lucky enough for a company to create clear core values and communicate them to the staff clearly and, and repeat it, you're ahead of the game, first of all, because I think a lot of companies don't do that. Um, and, and so I think first it needs to be created by a group of people who are not just the top executives alone in a room. It needs to be created by a, a cross section of the staff from all levels that have input into what they, they really believe in and what they feel that company's about. And then it needs to be selected out of those choices by the entire company. Um, my husband, Levi Sauerbrei and I are writing a book on a proprietary system on how to develop and roll out core values. And we really believe that core values are the intersection of culture and marketing. Mm -hmm. So the core values start with the employee and then the story is, is what you should use to tell your company's story, not just the, about your product, right? Like not just about the features of whatever your product or service is. People want to know your story and that's what makes them want to work with you. So I think that the way you ensure that the behaviors your staff adopts are predicated by these core values is, is you set up systems that communicate those core values remind them of those core values. And then you set up a system by which you interview people and make sure that they fit into those core values. You reward and recognize based on the core values and have people recognize each other for ways they're representing those core values and reward on that system. And you review regularly based on those core values, not just how good are you doing, but are you really measuring up to this core value? Do you really represent this all the time, some of the time, or none of the time? Right. And having that discussion between the manager and um, the employee. And this is something that we did in my company. I sold my company last year, but at Social Media Delivered for almost 10 years. That, that's something that we really excelled at. We saw it work, and we learned from it, and we made it better and better over the years. And it was it was amazing. We had a very strong culture an incredible group of people that we're still very, very close to. Um, and, and, and those, those values meant something to us. So, so there's often a, 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 a trap that you can fall into when you go down a, a road like that. And that's, you know, having too many, you know, values, because let's face it, I mean, we're going to say the age thing again, right? You know, when when one is younger, one tends to have lots and lots of things that you care passionately about. And then as you get older, you get a little more selective to the point where, you know, you have a small subset of things that really, really matter. And and those are the guiding principles, you know, that you live your life by. So it's the same for company. I see, I have experienced this in the past and seen companies have like this you know, big list of the core values and you go, wow, that's a, that's a really nice list. Um, but it's impossible to do what you're talking about here if you have a really exhaustive list of values. You really got to get down to the ones that matter to you, right? I recently went with a friend who walked me through a company and he showed me four different posters in the company. Um, this is a very successful, very respected company. And I believe there were 23 core values or points for success, 23 or 28. I actually can't even remember how many there were because there were so dang many. So my rule for core values is never, ever more than five right. ever because people can't remember them. And ideally three to four, three to four. So most humans, including myself can only remember three things most of the time, four if we're really lucky and they're really compelling. Even I'm, think about somebody who has like four grandkids or like Johnny, Sarah, yeah. Julie, and what was that? What's that other one's name? Yeah. I don't remember, yeah. right? So that's their grandkids. So let's stick with three at the most four. If you really like are just need it, five. And then those core values need to be described in typically half of a sentence. Right. right, really short where people need to do it. The other thing that we um, are, are working on in our book is is how we are developing iconography, so a symbol for each core value. And this is not an elaborate symbol; it's a very almost like a logo for that particular core value. 
That's a really interesting. I like that. That's a really interesting concept. Uh, um, I used something similar to that uh, some number of years ago at a company where, you know, the first part of of my time at the company was kind of re rebirthing the brand, if you like. So I put a huge yeah. so I put a huge phoenix on the wall. Um, you know, rising out of the fire, and later on, you know, as we went through uh, different uh, iterate, uh, different changes or evolutions in the company, you know, it changed what what it was communicating. But I re- I really like that idea because I think sometimes values to some people seem kind of ethereal, you know, aspirational, but but, yeah. but not really meaningful. So how? So okay, if you pick, uh, you know, three or four, whatever it is, which I think is is a good number. Um, are there are there any values that is there one value that you think is a must for everybody or are they really so company dependent? Um, no, I absolutely don't think that there's a value that is a must for everyone. I mean, you can think of all the different companies in the world and who they are, and one thing that is important to them is not important to someone else. You might say like integrity and honesty and whatever, and like. Is every company really that? No, they're, they're not. I'm, I'm not going to pretend like that's the case. And I actually really hate um, the core values that are the same as everyone else's, even if it's a play on something that you believe, like customer service or whatever. Yeah, don't call it customer service. Come up with a specific way that is an inside story for your group. A, a company is like a family. It's a group of people that love each other and sometimes hate each other and are dysfunctional and are sometimes together more than they want to be and then really enjoy each other. Like maybe, maybe it's only my family that is this way, but (laughs) I really think that companies are like families and that doesn't mean we all love each other all the time and things are perfect. It means we've made a commitment for a period of time to be together Mm -hmm. and to be there for each other. And we're going to decide what we stand for and we're going to work under that agreement together until we change it. So every company should have a different set of core values. You're going to see some things repeated because I think that humans are mostly good. Mm -hmm. And I think that we want a lot of the same things, but there need to be these inside jokes and these inside stories that form traditions. Culture is built out of traditions in a company. And that can't happen until you define what the core values you want to create are. You cannot grow a company from five people to 30 people to a hundred people and expect them to, um, you know, carry on these core values. If you haven't clearly defined them, you haven't reiterated them, you haven't rewarded people based on them, you haven't turned them into jokes and inside stories and little shared experiences between the group, um, it just won't work. Yeah, because what I see happen a lot of times is a culture in an organization grows organically, right? Uh, And then somebody kind of goes, okay, let's fit some values that kind of resonate with the kind of culture that we've kind of, you know, that has kind of grown up. And so it's all kind of reverse engineered slightly as opposed to, I think what you're talking about is deliberately deciding, you know, who you are and where you want to go and where you, who you want to be as a company. Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you have the opportunity with a startup, doing it from the beginning is great. And then you begin to hire people based on what you want to build. But I I think you have a point that there are a lot of companies who go along the way, experience some success, and then suddenly they need to come up with the core values. And some of those are going to come from things that have already happened in the company and stories that have already been told in the company. And if you take all levels of your people and build that list and then have everyone select they will self-select what is real and what is not. They will reject what is crap. So then, um, so how do you manage that the, because there's a potential for conflict between maybe something that is important to me at one level of, or one part of the organization and something that may be important to the higher level of the organization or whatever. I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you resolve kind of those conflicts? Well, I've definitely, as I've worked with a couple of companies on that, seen some of that conflict. And a lot of it is really eye-opening for an owner Mm -hmm. to understand that he or she's ideal and most important thing does not always match with now the 150 people at the company or the 300 people at the company and the way they feel and the way they see the company. Sometimes it's disappointing for the owner to understand that something else is is so much more important. And sometimes it turns into something that's really revolutionary and exciting and leads to a deeper understanding for that owner to hear that 
this is what's really going on and this is what's really important to people. So um, you need to have, ideally, uh, an outside person come in that you trust that's going to take you through that process because otherwise the person who has all the money and power will always have the deciding factor. And and let's be honest, the person who is leading the company should have a very strong opinion and and should really be able to look at those things. But you need an outside person to say, um, this is what's really going on. And people really feel this way. And they're really happy about this thing about your company that you didn't even know they were happy about. And they respect it and they're thrilled about it. Or there are some issues, the things that you're trying to push just don't fit with the way the company's been operating. Mm -hmm. And either the way you operate needs to change or the way you're representing yourself needs to change. So getting back to the, the the digital aspect, because I was just um, thinking while um, while we were talking here is, again, as like I said earlier, is you know there's a lot more touch points for customers, but there's also a lot more places where you communicate who you are, where a prospect or a, or somebody who comes to your company who can see you online, who can see your people on LinkedIn, who can see all these different people all over the place. Um, so I would think that that makes it even more critical that you have some kind of shared values across the organization so you're at least con- communicating something consistently. Sure. And I think that um, even if, if a company develops iconography and they put it in their physical locations, a lot of times they're not putting it online when somebody goes onto their screen or in the auto signature so people outside of the company can see it. The reason I'm more for the iconography and not the long wording is because then a prospect or a client or the person I'm serving can ask that employee, what is, what's that symbol? So it should represent something, but it shouldn't tell the story because hopefully you've hired intelligent people that you believe in who fit this culture Mm -hmm. and you want them to tell the story. You want them to translate it in their words and it gives them the freedom to do that. So um, keeping it in front of them, having online reward recognition programs that people can say, you know, this person that I'm working for, my coworker out of South Africa, I want to send her a reward that she can order something online. And it's because she represented this core value and I can click onto it and I can share that with her and it's on chat or it's on an internet that people can see. Yeah, I, I think that's a great uh, a great idea. I like that idea a lot of you having something that prompts uh, somebody external to the company to ask you about it. Because what a great opportunity for you to, to sort of tell them what makes you different and what yeah. makes you unique as an organization without you saying it first, right? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're bumping up against the end of our time here, Eve. So uh, if you'd like to tell the people a little bit more about yourself, about the book that you're writing when it's coming out and how they can learn more about you. So my name is Eve Mayer. That's M-A-Y-E-R. And the website, very originally, is evemayer.com. We just launched it a month ago. Um, I've been in digital marketing and company culture for a really long time, mm-hmm. and I'm an author and a speaker, and my business partner is Levi Sauerbrei. He's known as Nerd Butler. <laughs> I'm known as LinkedIn Queen, so you can see how that relationship works great. Yeah. Um, but you can check us out at evemayer.com, also on Twitter at uh, LinkedIn Queen. And the book is something that we're writing now and that we hope to be out early next year. Excellent. But we are talking a bit about this topic, actually, uh, in a couple of weeks in Portland. Um, My very first trip to Portland, so I'm really pumped because I've always wanted to go. And so we will be at Digital Summit in Portland talking about the intersection of marketing and company culture and exploring core values and everything we talked about today. Excellent. Well, I highly recommend you going to see uh, Eve if you're in the Portland area. And thank you again, Eve, for for talking to us. Uh, Great pleasure as always. Great insights. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.